just really straight off here, uh, talking about really what we're aiming to achieve whenever we're running our external quality assessments. We're looking to improve our accuracy. Um, not really just uh, the end goal, as I say, is to improve accuracy. It's, it's not really just worthwhile just improving our precision, uh, although that is a very good starting point. Um, because if we improve our precision, that gives us a much clearer picture of potentially how we can improve our accuracy. If we have, so I'll just bring up the pointer here. So there we go. So if we are um, close to the actual correct value, but yet still have poor precision, on any single measurement, you're not going to know really where you stand. So really the, the main goal, probably improve your precision, and then it really will help us to look at improving our accuracy. So why are both important? Uh, really because on any single measurement, uh, there will be both uh, errors types involved. There will be potentially imprecision and also inaccuracy. And it's this combination of both random and systematic errors then that have uh, basically introduced error into our system. So normally precision, when we're looking at it, um, we, if you measure the same sample uh, time and time again, you'll have a normal spread of results due to random errors. The accuracy, however, how far you are away from the correct value, um, that isn't known by just looking at your precision. So we have to look at that outside of, uh, in this case, normally our internal QC. And this is why we're, we're running our external quality assessments. But also there's a degree of where looking at our peer group and peer group systems that this comes into play as well. So this is one of the reasons that we're going to be discussing uh, with Lindsay after myself, uh, then how peer group systems can also be useful in determining uh, accuracy aspects. So what's the main difference between our EQA and IQC? Um, Whenever we're sort of doing these sort of presentations, uh, it's difficult to know um, all the, the various levels of people that we are, we're talking to. Um, so this may be basic for some of you, uh, but it's, it's just really a reminder of the main differences. So really, your internal QC, yeah, okay, you want to see basically, are my results today the same as they were yesterday? Is my system still within control as far as precision is concerned? Um, so really with regards to external quality assessments, as I said, really we're looking to see are the results the same as other labs using the same method and instruments? So this is where it really fits in. Your EQA is a determination of your bias or your accuracy. Your internal QC is your precision. Now, in this example here that I have on the screen, it really looks obviously very clear cut that um, your actual value is so far away. But as we know, that's not normally the case. Sometimes your accuracy can be mixed in and actually very close. We really don't have much of a bias. And if that's the case, this is what I was saying earlier. If your precision is too wide, pardon me, it's going to be hard to determine what the actual accuracy is. So, first of all, aim to achieving your precision. Sorry, improve your precision, uh, and then that will help us uh, as a next step determining what our accuracy is. So, once again, main differences. So, primary objective. And in turn QC, your main objective is to improve your precision. 
external quality assessment, it's your accuracy or bias. Internal QC, you know what the target is. If you're using an assay control, that is. Um, obviously, with a precision control, you set that target value yourself after doing repeat samples. Um, and then part of the actually the determination is is that target correct? Um, so this is one of the, the, the goals why you would use an assay control over precision control. So blind sample. Uh, that is the main goal uh, for EQA. Okay, external quality assessment, as I say, it's a blind sample. One of the differences here between EQA and, once again, peer group systems uh, is that with the peer group system, you do know what, because it's an extension of your internal quality control, you do know what the, the peer system is, or sorry, what the target value is. Uh, an external quality assessment is completely blind. Frequency, okay. Once again, intern QC, it's daily. You're running it uh, real time. So basically, it has an immediate effect on what you're doing within your system. External quality assessment tends to be more retrospective, tends to be bi weekly, monthly, or quarterly. Number of samples. Normally, with your internal QC, that's it. You run your sample. If it passes, you normally work, move on. If it fails, you do your assessment and you can repeat until it passes, until you resolve the situation. External quality assessments, you run it. It can take a lot longer in order to get that um, answer back. So it certainly is it very much so is retrospective, uh, and you do only run it once, one sample at a time. In general, statistical comparisons. Basically, then you're looking to the target value in your QC kit insert. Uh, if it's precision control, it'll be a rough guide. Uh, if it's an assay, it'll be more targeted towards your instrument and potentially your method. It can be looking at a fixed mean or a running mean, and that's important whenever we do some of our troubleshooting later on. Certainly then with your external quality assessment, you're looking to have a, a larger peer group in order to um, have a consensus mean, which is significant. So really ideally, this will be to the same reagent instrument uh, or method. Um, certainly what you're trying to do is see how far your results are against uh, that chosen peer group. In this case, once again, for troubleshooting, it's really important that we uh, correctly register ourselves. So a lot of the problems that we'll see within the external quality assessment is a uh, comparison against the wrong uh, peer group mean because the assay details are incorrect. Okay, problem solving. Really, your intern QC does aim to detect sudden and gradual performance shifts from the target value. Your external quality assessment will also then reflect changes seen in the internal, and very much is very often the case that we'll see um, similar shifts between internal QC and external. However, with your internal QC, sometimes if you're ranges are too wide, um, then these shifts may not be noticeable. Whereas then you'll still, you'll still see these potentially in your external. So um, they very much so go hand in hand. You need both. As I say, total error uh, involves both aspects of your precision and your, your bias. Uh, certainly, then the systems we put in place to try and reduce the risks that we have for these errors is we need both their internal QC and our external quality assessment. Okay, we do get asked occasionally about using a third party internal QC, uh, specifically an assay control. Uh, does this replace the need for EQA? 
Well, um, no. Purely because looking at international standards, our external quality assess assessment is still mandatory. Once again, primary objective for internal is to maintain our precision. And also, if you're using, as I say, an assay control, it does give you a limited indication as to accuracy, especially whenever you're using a peer group system. The primary objective of your external is to maintain accuracy. Really, we need both. And you should have EQA and internal QC for every assay and instruments that you are using for your analysis on a day-to-day -day basis. Both are important. Looking at the regulatory requirements, uh, if you're an accredited laboratory, uh, and this is your ISO 15189, it is a requirement to run external quality assessment. Uh, this is the actual clause in the standard. It says the laboratory shall monitor the results of interlaboratory comparison programs and participate in, in the implementation of corrective actions when predetermined performance criteria are not fulfilled. Important point here. So it's not just the participation, but it's also what we do with that information once we get it. So it's the implementation of corrective actions. But also to mention that this is actually part of your processes. So here we have then further down in the clause, it basically says that the participation uh, includes defined responsibilities and instructions for participation. Any performance criteria that differ from the criteria used in the, in the interlaboratory comparison program. This is down to the laboratory to establish. So it's very much a case of you setting up your own policies, your own processes to use, uh, obviously to look at the various risks uh, that you have within your own laboratory setup. There are a number of rules that we need to look at uh, whenever we talk about external quality assessments and its role within um, the international standards for the laboratories, the 15189. So here's a few of them. So the laboratories shall integrate your comparison samples into routine workflow. Okay. Number two. The interlaboratory comparison samples shall be examined by personnel who routinely examine patient samples. Okay, once again, using the same procedures. You shall, uh, shall not communicate with other participants, basically about the sample until after the date for submission. And the laboratory shall not refer interlaboratory comparison samples for confirmatory examinations. Okay, so what does this all mean? What does this mean? So basically, you don't call your friend in another lab, basically looking uh, to see what they submitted before you submit your results. It means that you analyze the samples using your normal staff, your normal methods and procedures. What we're trying to determine here is what your typical analysis is. It's your typical performance. This is very important um, whenever we're looking at trying to use external quality assessment to improve your performance. But what we need to see is what your typical performance is like. So there's no point having one person who is specifically uh, in place to run external quality assessment samples. It's no point having or putting methods or procedures in place which are unusual or different from your normal processes. So in order to determine your bias that you have, we need to look at what your typical analysis is. So we need to know what your typical performance is. It is there to basically help you to review and assess your analytical performance. 
it's not there's no point contacting somebody else looking to see what their performance was like certainly you can uh, very much the case of uh, contact other people afterwards and uh, who's people who are maybe in the same situation as yourself using the same instruments as yourself afterwards but initially we need to know to assess what your performance is like um, without any outside interference. So the focus should be on regular quality improvement, not just for fulfilling your minimum requirements. And that is, well, two of the main purposes of EQA. It should be helping you to reduce your errors and provide you with confidence in the results that you're achieving. Why is this important? Well, we look at regular participation. It helps to identify issues sooner and help to take corrective actions in a more timely fashion. But more importantly, then regular participation then helps to confirm those corrective actions that you've taken. How effective have they been to resolve the situation, to resolve the problems that you may have? I've shown this, uh, I know I've been with you in person um, a few times uh, over the last number of years, um, and I think I might have shown this chart before to some of you. But uh, this is looking at the differences between our bi-weekly scheme and our monthly scheme for, well, I have three examples here, one for chemistry, one for immunoassay, and one for hematology. And what we're looking at here is the performance at which 90% of our labs uh, basically that can achieve a target score of 50. So basically you're looking at the, 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 the criteria that we use uh, that 90% of participants can achieve. Excuse me. And here you can see basically in all cases except for one that the bi-weekly scheme uh, the performance is better overall compared to the monthly. Once again, more regular participation. Here we have the immunoassay as well. Once again, same situation. And then to finish with the hematology. Not as much maybe uh, of, uh, differences you can see, but certainly for most of them, participation is still better. So what does this show us? Um, whenever we looked at this to try and to do some analysis, we looked at you know, where were these labs from? Uh, was there any difference between where globally that the labs were situated? That wasn't the case. Was it the, uh, the case that uh, we looked at how long the participants had been participating? That wasn't the case either. So it was the same for really new or for well long established laboratories. What we seem to, to, to find here that the only link was um, just the um, involvement that they put in. The more involved that they were, the more regular participation, the quicker the turnaround of the results in order to give feedback to look at the effectiveness of their corrective actions. This seems to have a major impact then in improving the overall performance, overall. So report interpretation, we're not going to go into report interpretation this morning, um, but really it's just to say that participation in itself doesn't lead to an improvement in quality of analytical performance. You need to really interpret and understand your reports. But more as we looked at the clause within the ISO itself, you have to look at putting conclusions, determining what the problems are, putting corrective actions into place. So, uh, first of all, what should you do when you have poor performance? Well, um, first of all, question to ask. Do you have a written process in your lab to deal with EQA performance flags? So this is the case. So do you have a written process? 
So is it, do you just follow the same as what we have? So you just look at uh, maybe a target score of less than 50? Are you looking at a standard deviation greater than two? Or potentially are you looking at other areas? So are you looking at, um, once again, uh, uh, the development of trends? So everything may be within your 2SD range, but are you looking to uh, look at successive samples? Are they all on one side of the mean? Similar to what you would do with your multi rules and your ex and your internal QC. So this is for you to have your own written processes. And then what do you do with this? Well, the important thing is, and where this helps us is basically if you've had previous flags and how they were resolved. If you've got a, a good historical record of how you dealt with them, there is a potential then that they will help to improve and speed up the process of uh, doing further corrective actions moving forward. And this is where a checklist is really very useful and, and, and important. Basically, a simple uh, list of potential issues that you can go down. Simple either yes or no uh, answers. Um, looking basically at all the main concepts through from your sample handling, basically the clerical side of things. Did you make a, a transcription error? Have you actually entered the correct results? Looking to then your assay details. Are you actually registered correctly? Are you being compared to the correct mean? Doing a like for like comparison to your internal QC. The important thing, as I say, to, to mention within this is um, a simple list that all staff can actually uh, work their way through. This whole process that you have within the laboratory it needs to be um, looked at by not just the, the, um, the manager, but also the actual and staff. It, it really is a team approach in order to improve quality overall within the system. So if I was to ask you the question, how is Rickus going for your lab? Would it just be a case of, yes, we're, we're doing fantastic. How do we know this? Well, if the staff aren't involved in actually doing a review of their reports, uh, or they're not actually getting any feedback with from the actual reports themselves, that may be the answer that they're giving. They may be thinking that everything is fine. So it's very much as a case of a team approach here and looking to really review your reports uh, closely and basically then to see, I'm really sorry, should I say, passing that information on within the team so that basically everybody's involved in improving the whole situation. In this case here, this lab has a number of flags. Now, those flags uh, may mean that you have a development of uh, some accuracy issues. It may be a simple one-off, but it may be the start of a process. So this is where we're talking about having a process in place. So do you just do uh, a corrective action based on a single result? Um, I would say no, but this is where we're going to look at the various processes that we have in place. Um, so this is independent. Uh, I can't give you a general resolution here. This is very much the processes that you have within your own situation and within your own laboratory. But looking at internal QC and having acceptable internal QC results is not enough. Uh, it's insufficient. In this example here, this is an old example that I've shown uh, a few times before in the past. This lab here, their internal QC was fine, but yet we see their external quality assessment. They had a very strong positive bias for a very long time. And the, the, basically they ignored that because their internal QC was acceptable. 
but yet the full time that they were running this, this was then affecting their patient samples uh, for weeks on end. Um, and we're going to look at, well, what should they have done in this case? We'll talk about that basically as we go along. So how to review your results. So the question to start with, okay, you've got your result back from your, from your external quality assessments. Is the result within your acceptable performance limits? So does it have a target score greater than 50? Um, is the SDI less than two standard deviations? So let's go down the line that it's not. So we failed one, if not more, of our performance criteria. Let's do the simple things first. So has the transcription error occurred? Basically, have you written in the wrong result? Or have you analyzed the result correctly, but you've just typed in the, re the result incorrectly? Or maybe you transcribed two results wrong? So if it is a simple case like that, simply send us the correct results along with the relevant documentation. OK, let's say the answer is no. So a transcription error has not occurred. The results that you've put in have all been correct. Once again, look at the simple things first. So are you being compared to the correct uh, assays? So are you being correct to the, the correct consensus? If the answer is no, well, once again, very simply, advise us of the correct details. Please remember that very often, if your kits change, uh, standardization may change, uh, so your assay details, once again, may change over a course of your participation. If the answer then is yes, that the assay details are correct, okay, let's look at some issues to do with the actual sample. So, are the majority of the results flagged, as in this example here? This could be a case that you've actually measured the wrong sample, or that you've actually measured the correct sample, but you've prepared the sample incorrectly. If that was the case, you would see something like this. All the deviations should all be roughly in the same sort of range, all going in the same sort of direction. This would tend to be an example of uh, basically where you've measured the correct sample, but you just made it up in the incorrect volume. So let's carry on down the line. So assuming that that's not the case, okay, what else are we going to look at then? So um, has, for example, any of your instrument parameters or your calibration changed? Has the reagent batch changed that you've, that you've been using? Once again, if you remember from the checklist, these are things that we can just simply work our, or work our way down, basically to help us resolve the situation. So, uh, in this case that we just mentioned, if they were all mentioned basically all in the same side, then there may be a problem of the sample, maybe the wrong sample or made up incorrectly. If the answer to here is this no, then okay, let's do a comparison to our internal QC and check that there were no issues with our internal QC at the same time. This was the case, then use two things. You want to look at your QC limits being out of um, out of range, or you're looking for the development of shifts or trends, the, the, which we'll talk about here just, uh, just in a moment. What we're really looking for is to investigate and take corrective actions. The main thing with your internal QC is look, doing a like-for-like -like comparison and ensuring not only looking in terms of standard deviations, but in terms of a percentage deviation. Very often what we see is when we compare internal QC to external quality assessments, is that when we do it in comparison to a percentage deviation, that the performance is actually very similar. But because of maybe a large range in your internal QC, then that's not always noticeable. Let's go down 
Um, let's go down uh, the line. Sorry, I'll just uh, ignore that just for just for just for now. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that just afterwards at the end. Um, so basically, it's the result within acceptable performance limits. If it is, you could say, well, is that the end of our check that we need to do? And I would say the answer to that is actually no, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, just because it's within range doesn't mean that you haven't got the, the, the start of a development of a trend. You actually may have a positive or negative bias, um, which is quite consistent. Um, but because it's within range, it's not necessarily just, okay, we'll just ignore it. It could be something that you need to, to deal with. So, mainly what you're looking at then, if all the results are within range, any points within one, outside of one standard deviation, the answer to that is no, then there is still a potential for a trend developing. So if you're all on one side of the mean and you're all gradually getting worse. Once again, similar things that you would look at potentially with your internal QC and then with looking at multi-rules where you're looking at development of trends. So all results on one side of the mean, no. All results within, uh, so you haven't got any results outside one standard deviation and you're fluctuating nicely around the target then what we would say is no further actions in this case. So you can move on. The main goal, however, whenever you do have a problem is to establish your root cause. Keep asking the questions why. Why did the problem occur? And then keep asking the questions. So it's trying to delve down deeper and deeper into the situation to try and find out the root cause of why the, 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 what caused it to develop in the very first place, so that you can prevent it from happening again. Um, then you ask the question, you put resolutions into place and we ask, well, how do we know we made a difference? And basically, hopefully you should be able to see changes and improvement of performance very quickly. However, that sometimes isn't necessarily what's going to happen because sometimes you're relying on your instrument manufacturer maybe to re-standardize or you're looking at potentially uh, having to develop a, a, a different process that may take time to implement. So um, running regular EQA will help um, to know if you made a difference and will help more quickly, but it may still take you some time. As I mentioned earlier, the more people that we have in the team that's involved in this process, the quicker and the, the more readily that will uh, improve the quality within our, our lab situation. Just to finish, um, we're going to look at some uh, of these errors and potential causes for them. We mentioned about random error uh, where there's potentially no explanation after your investigation. That's because they, they are random. Really what we're looking for uh, mainly is your systematic error where whenever you repeat the analysis, the error repeats or certainly more consistently uh, anyway. So random error can come in various, this is only four simple um, possibilities where you have bubbles maybe in the reagents, you have improperly mixed or dissolved reagents in your controls, small clogs in your pipettes where you're not basically delivering the full volumes, uh, you can have simple power supply fluctuations. These are four simple situations, but there are many more um, that can cause random errors. Really what we're looking for are unexpected and unaccepted uh, well, shifts away from the expected result. Generally, statistically speaking, one out of 20 errors are random anyway, statistically. Um, so normally the case is if you repeat the control, 
the error that you saw was gone. This is really what we're talking about. They are very much random. Uh, you'll see this in your internal QC as well as your external. In this case, uh, you'd see probably a good fluctuation around the, the consensus, around the target. Uh, so you can say your precision is good, but you do have a few random outliers. Um, even that one it's, isn't an outlier as such, but certainly is a different performance. Here we see one result here, which is outside. So random results. So, if all causes have been excluded, a single unacceptable result is probably due to random error. Probably, not necessarily the case, because it could be the very first result in where you've got the development of a shift or a trend. So, it still needs to be investigated. Uh, you can't just simply ignore it. Um, but whenever you do repeat your analysis, if it is acceptable, the, the, the thing to really to mention is don't tamper, uh, don't make corrective actions or take corrective actions to which you do not have the root cause. Because if you do that, very much can be the case that you actually introduce additional errors into your system, and it can increase the probability of a future unacceptable result. So, tampering based on one single result, you shouldn't do it. This is the case, you need to get to the root cause of the problem. So, once again, if you're faced with a random error, look at the easiest things first. Uh, you potentially will have to rerun the control. And basically what we're looking for then, if the control is still out of range, then Really, it's probably not a random error then. It's now a systematic error. Quickly looking at some of these systematic errors. Shifts, where you have a sudden and dramatic um, change in your performance, generally in one direction. Uh, a shift usually marks a dramatic event, but may also indicate uh, a correction i.e. you change your range a lot, it may be a change in maintenance, a change in calibration. These can all lead to sudden shifts in performance. Um, here we have an example where we, this lab is running with a, a positive bias. Uh, they had this black line means there been a change in assay details. They actually were changing then the reagent that they were using. And here you can actually see their performance has shifted dramatically uh, and given them an even stronger positive bias. And this is actually represented here on their histogram as well. As you can see, they're actually joining a small group of other labs who actually had changed uh, reagent to a different reagent supplier that was actually giving them a, a stronger bias. Um, one thing to mention as well, even in this example here, this result, what's a, a, a higher concentration that they would normally run in their internal QC, and their internal QC actually didn't cover this level of performance, whereas their external did. One of the other differences uh, between internal QC and external quality assessment. So, here you can see, in this case, positive shifts. Uh, in this case here, just on one lot, although you do actually have it slightly moving in the second lot as well. Because that's what happens. Sometimes you'll see biases and shifts, uh, not necessarily across both levels, but it may be at a low concentration or potentially at a high concentration. Doesn't necessarily have to be uh, across the system across your concentration range. Sometimes shifts are good as well. And here you can see this lab was running with a negative bias, had a sudden shift, um, and as you can see, the performance improved. Not actually completely correctly, mind you, in that this case here, they're still actually now running with a slight positive bias. What you should see is random variation around the target or the consensus mean. 
So they still have a slight problem here uh, in that they move from a negative bias to a slight positive bias. So possible types of errors that lead to shifts. Um, once again, just a small example uh, where you have a. Once again, you're looking for sudden, potentially sudden changes here, or things that you have done within the lab, where you have a sudden either improvement or a dramatic fail. So you can have a change or failure in your light source uh, instrument maintenance, way, which may actually improve your performance, or once again, you may actually have to see a sudden shift neg negatively in your performance. Uh, failure in your sample handling system, change in temperature, failure in your, your dispense system, uh, reagent formulation, new reagent lots, especially calibrations and re-standardizations, and change in calibration lot. Things that show you a dramatic change and sudden shift in performance. Trends tend to be more gradual, uh, more looking at wear and tear potentially, or where you're using reagents which are outside of expiry or outside of your open vial stability. Sometimes they are down to maintenance uh, where you've got uh, clogs uh, building up in your tubes. And also potentially down to calibrations where your calibration is, is shifting uh, over time. In this case here, you can see the development of a trend. But you also actually see more trends here if you look more longer term process. So you can actually see there's a trend here over time where you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down. These probably are where the lab has done a recalibration. But as you can see, instead of for following the normal pattern, we've actually started to keep going upward in this case, which is outside of our normal pattern. So it is potentially the development of a, a different trend than normal. In this case here, you have, once again, probably reasonably good performance fluctuate around the mean, and then you have a gradual trend down where you're on one side of the, the target, where you've got the, the, this development of a negative trend. Trends, once again, um, tend to be, well, a few examples here, accumulation of debris, accumulation of in your electrodes, for example, incubation chamber temperatures. Um, they tend to be, gradual, as I say, a gradual shift in performance. Really, the, the last one is where the shifts and the trends are where you're, you're, you're looking at a, a change in performance. A bias is where you've had this over uh, multiple samples. And they tend to be then what we're looking at are um, steady, basically a steady state, a steady bias. Um, if we look at this sort of example here, here we see a reasonably good precision. Um, we're looking at a poor accuracy and with a large negative bias. Or in this case, the other way around. And if we refer this back to the, the example that we looked at, uh, that I, I said before earlier with this, the one lab that had that strong positive bias for alkaline phosphatase, they had a strong positive bias, which was quite consistent. And this was because they had introduced a, a slope into the situation that they had introduced themselves in order to try and resolve a problem that they didn't get to the root cause of. And they had introduced a 10% slope into that. So when faced with a systematic error, what do you look for? It's once again, go through the list. Uh, you're looking for things which are quite regularly potentially changing within the system. 
So has the region or, or the ridge lot, has it been changed recently? Has it expired? Has the control lot changed? Once again, has it expired? Calibrator, same again. When was the calibration last done? Did it pass successfully? Has maintenance been performed routinely? And once again, is it on schedule? Are parameters for that test correct on the analyzer? Is it the volume set up correctly? The temperature, the wavelength? Has the test operator changed recently? Once again, are all your staff following the same processes, the same procedures? Have you introduced one different factor into the system? Have you got new staff, maybe who's coming in, who's not familiar with the way that the system's being run? Looking for things one at a time that potentially may have changed uh, from your previous performance. So, just as I mentioned there, have the correct procedures been followed? And this is, once again, where I just want to draw your attention back to the EPA performance checklist. Going through this list and having your own processes and your own procedures in place will really dramatically help you to try and determine, first of all, do you have a problem, a real problem in the first place, and then how you deal with it. Um, we in Randox, and certainly with our, ourselves in the external quality assessment, are more than happy to, to work with you to try and uh, resolve any situations that you may have with regards to your external quality assessment. And we are more than happy, um, pardon me, we're more than happy to be able to, to work with not only you, but also within the instrument manufacturers and basically looking at to try and resolve not only if it's a participant problem, but if it's an instrument or reagent based issue. Um, because that's really one of the roles that we have as, with an external quality assessment is to work to try and help bring standardization across all the various methods and instruments. So I'm going to end there.